Hello, everybody. Welcome to another TFE Live. This is our show number 264 for Valentine's Day, the 14th of February, 2020. Welcome. Julie, I've got, instead of our titles up here, I got the dollars up. If they want to become a patron, you can go over to sailingillustrated.com and join us as a patron. Of course, Julia, our co-host, I see your flowers, beautiful flowers. Yes. Uh, yes. Where'd those come from? A secret admirer. Anybody we know? Uh, you might. Okay. Well, you've got a lot of them. Do you want to do your like, share, and subscribe thingy? Yes. Uh, as a special gift of love on Valentine's Day, <laughs> why don't you uh, like, share, and subscribe to this program? That would be very nice indeed. I'm your host, Tom Eamon. Let's get the show on the road. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, standing by in Auckland, New Zealand, he was our first guest, our first Skype guest way back in September of 2017. He's been on the show a number of times since, the esteemed editor of Sail Dash, the New Zealand editor of Sail Dash World.com, our longtime friend Richard Gladwell. Richard? How are you? Our, Greetings. I trust you. Happy, happy Valentine's Day, Tom. Thank you. It's day after I, down there. Yeah, 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 but that's all right. Is that, is that your Valentine plant behind you? That is Julia's Valentine plant, her, her, her roses. Behind cake, behind me is, that's the same old, same old, including oh, our crouton, yeah. yeah. <laughs> our same old, same old. Uh, Richard, uh, we're going to go into some depth with the America's Cup. Uh, do, you, do you remember how many times you've been on the show? No. Five no. or six times, something like that, over oh, the last two and a half years. But it's been a while. Four. At least oh, four. Yeah. Been a while. At least four. Yeah. yeah. But in uh, any event, welcome and welcome to all of you. Delighted to have you here. Let's um, get on with the some of the slides here. It is Valentine's Day here in, well, in, in Europe and North America. So any of you who are celebrating it, or I suppose most everybody is, happy Valentine's Day. It's also a birthday today. Three of our foesy, I noticed, Julia, uh, who are Facebook uh, friends, right. Mary Longpree, Ben Nichols, and Daniel Forster are all celebrating birthdays today, so happy birthday to them. Uh, this is how they're celebrating Valentine's Day, or did yesterday, in Hong Kong, where it is now tomorrow. It is Saturday in Hong Kong as well. And for a little updates, thanks to all of you who are sending us the info on this uh, croutonic coronavirus, and it's starting to look you know, just when they think, oh, well, it's not going to be so bad. And then the CDC, which is our Centers for Disease Control here in the U.S., uh, is their their concern. Uh, you got that yeah, coming through I, on one of Julia's devices. I changed, changed. 15 seconds ago. So uh, the coronavirus is obviously a bit of a threat. And this was the information just before we went to air from CBS from the CDC, our Centers for Disease Control, and also from WHO, the World Health Organization. Uh, I think the first and the last paragraph here, the head of the CDC said the new coronavi uh, coronavirus, which has killed almost 1,400 people and is still spreading in China, could be around for at least another year. Mm. So, you know, people are concerned about the Olympics. We might be concerned about the America's Cup, Richard. We'll see. With the Chinese government reporting 121 more deaths and more than 5,000 new confirmed and suspected cases Thursday alone, the illness dubbed COVID-19 for 2019 doesn't appear to have peaked. Last paragraph, while the disease takes a fast-mounting toll and sparks increasing scenes of draconian control measures being enforced in mainland China, the good news is here, there have only been three deaths blamed on it elsewhere, one in each in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Japan. The U.S. has, as of yesterday, had 15 confirmed cases, but none are said to be suffering serious symptoms. Uh, Jean-Pierre Keekins and others sent us notes with you know, all the usual stuff, but I, I don't want to repeat it here. You all can see it. You obviously the wash your hands and don't touch your face and try to stay out of enclosed spaces. Speaking of which, there are a lot of publicity in the UK today. Sky News running a big piece about London's tube being a virus hotbed. Uh, okay. And I can imagine, you know how warm it is down there, yeah. Julie, right? Right. Down in the tube. 
So that's a concern. But speaking of the Olympics, specifically of the Olympics, the WHO, the World Health Organization, who are over there now just, just landing, I guess, today, Saturday, in Japan, uh, to, or sorry, in China, to start get, getting a, a, a handle on it because China heretofore hadn't been very welcoming to outsiders. Uh, but the WHO has told the IOC at a meeting this week there is no case so far for canceling or postponing the Olympics, the Tokyo Olympics. Uh, they did say in this uh, statement that was released by Tokyo 2020, certainly the advice we've received externally from the WHO is that there's no case for any contingency plans or canceling the games or moving the games. I can't believe they're not doing contingency plans. Yeah, they've got to be. And then uh, Tokyo 2020 president Yoshiro Mori, who reiterated Coates, he's the guy from the WHO, comments today. No, he's the IOC guy, program commission. He says, criticized suggestions that the games could be canceled because of the coronavirus outbreak as, quote, irresponsible rumors. After the first day of the project review, the IOC is in Tokyo looking over the whole their, their when they have a commission that goes from time to time and checks on things. The Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo, Shinzo Abe, promised earlier this month that the country would respond appropriately and work closely with the WHO to ensure preps for Tokyo 2020 are not affected by the virus. Tokyo 2020 chief there in the last paragraph, however, admitted last week that he was, quote, seriously worried that the spread of the infectious disease could throw cold water on the momentum toward the games. And they apparently in Tokyo, I'm reading other articles, uh, had planned for a lot of Chinese to come over to, to Japan for the games. I'm also told that there are no Chinese sailors at the, we said this on Tuesday, at those events being run in Australia right now, the, the NACRA and the 49er and the FX Worlds and the Laser Worlds. Apparently no Chinese sailors there, Richard. Did you heard that? No, no, I mean, it's reading results. But and there's, that's, I, I'm, I'm reliably informed by people, Fosey, who were there, uh, John Emmett for one. And I'm also told that the, the Chinese sailing federation, at least, most of the Chinese athletes, at least in sailing and maybe more, are out of the country at this point training. Or so they say. What do you think of that, guys? I think it's smart. <laughs> well, I don't think it's true either. But let's maybe they did. Maybe they beat cheeks, as my sister would say, to get out of China as this thing was starting to percolate. Okay, well, we hope that doesn't become a I mean, it could even conceivably affect the America's Cup if this thing carries on, or these uh, maybe at these pre regattas, Richard. But well, there's hard hard border controls in there now, so. Um, they're manually checking everyone into Auckland, which is only happened the last week. You just so, picked you just picked your uh, son up. You said at the yeah, airport at yeah, Old Dark night. Thirty this morning. Yeah. So I mean, what happens in Auckland is this um, normally electronic processing of passports for particularly New Zealanders coming back, Australians and whoever else is in that system. So. They've now stopped that um, as a result of this outbreak. So everyone's having to go manual, which means you've got to, you know, be face to face with a, an immigration officer and be checked through on their system. So that's the first sort of step. And um, did they take did they take your son's temperature or with one of those heat guns or anything no, like I that? No, I don't think so. Well, no. I think they're only doing that for flights originating from China. Well, uh, yeah, I've certainly. Uh, Flights coming in from China will get a lot harder working over. But, I mean, the, the risk you've got is basically with Chinese people that have come in um, for their other countries and they're just trying to come through normal immigration procedures okay. and they're actually carrying the virus. Julia? Uh, Jay Henfield said... Why don't we, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I urge you all to follow Michael Vaughn on Facebook. He's been in Hong Kong for six months. Remember the free country got, the government don't don't doesn't tell you the truth who would think china would tell you the same well yeah the, you, you wouldn't mix i mean you would probably wouldn't expect our government to tell you no. the full truth either and that's F, why that's F, why you have media that's why you have people like richard gladwell right? f when has canceled china yeah the chinese and, grand prix is canceled and any number of other uh, events have been canceled 
And we'll keep an eye on this. I don't want to dwell on it. Yeah, I think. But uh, we do want to say hi to a lot of folks that are on Daniel Groon. Thank you for your note this morning, Daniel. is joining from Augsburg, a nice town in Germany, Augsburg is. Trevor Walker and J. Michael Kiss. Uh, cheers from CMH, Trevor Walker. What, what's CMH? I don't know. Trevor, tell us what CMH is, please. I hope it's not a hospital. It's, 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 pro- it's an airport, probably. Could be. Could be. Um, Clark Chapin from sunny but frigid Michigan, as is my mother. Stuart Sturley is in uh, the esteemed com- communications director for the New York Yacht Club. Stuart, it was good to see you in San Diego. Uh, hello, Tom and Julie. Listening from work in Sydney. That's Gary Roberts. Hamish Nickel, Hamish Nickel, Warren Schasser, good morning from Brisbane, Pedro Foiling Sailor in Sydney, Mark Somerville, hi Mark, Pedro Foiling Sailor's in Sandringham now for the Laser Worlds, the Gold Fleet, the, the Laser Worlds continue Saturday and Sunday, the other three events which are in Geelong, the NACRA, the at 49 and the FX wrap up today, Saturday, there, they've got two fleet races, they, yesterday they lost all the racing, we'll tell you more about that in a sec, and then, um, uh, yeah, Philip Buell is leading. We're going to mention that in a sec. Thank you for that, Pedro, for Peter Stevenson. Uh, John Sangmeister, Joe Cool, Neil Rollett, Jordan Smith, who you are over. A lot of people on here. Brad Rutenick, Sherry Smith, Larry Carr, Tony Ball. Hello, Tony. Neil, Neil Niley Williamson, Mark Husted, Clark Chapin, NB. This is Richards. Clark's done the research. Tenth appearance. Thank God for Clark. Wow. Tenth appearance, Richard, and that is also, I'm sure, a record in yes. terms of the number of people. But your show, I'm going to show the stats at the end of the show that Clark prepares for us yeah. and has just sent us a new a new batch. And your show is, one of your shows is far and away the number one, right, Julia? Yeah, we've ever had. Yeah. So that's good. It's probably an error on the counting. <laughs> I doubt it. Not Clark one. Chapin doesn't <laughs> not, make those kinds of errors. Clark Chapin. <laughs> <laughs> I might, but he doesn't. World Sailing System. Yeah, Daniel Groons, yeah, it's not looking very good with that virus. And no, our accounting is better than World Sailings, that's for sure. Carolyn Archer. Hello, Carolyn. I haven't seen you in a while. Jean Pierre Keekins, JPK. Thank you for those notes about the V Roos. Everyone's concerned about it. And we're concerned about it. You know, what most of us are in first world countries with good personal hygiene and good medical system. I don't think anyone has died in any other country. Is that right, Julia? No, they have. Have they? Yeah. I thought I I saw this morning and maybe it's a day old, but I thought no one had died. No, it's at least just in the U S is at least one, maybe two. Okay. But it's only, okay. That's two. But you know, how many people die of the, of the run of the mill flu? each day oh, than that. exactly i mean the issue that i haven't heard raised is what's the insurance situation so if you're looking at buying tickets for the olympics and you um go in and buy them this this is a, a known event at the time you um bought them you covered by insurance mm. depends on your friendly insurance agent well, but they're well, talking about the, the big insurance for the whole event. Oh, for the whole it's event. A, it's you know, yeah. it's a it's a well, no, no, it's, it's it's people like me traveling to the event. Ah, yeah. So what 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 happens there? Because I mean, normally you can't get covered for something like that if it's a known situation in the country. They say, well, that's your risk. And the problem with the virus is, I mean, it's you know, it's partially catching it, obviously, but it's um, more getting caught up in one of these quarantine situations and um, being stuck in a country for two weeks or three weeks or whatever they deem mm. the quarantine period to be, which is not cheap. Mark Husted is saying, I saw an interesting comment during the week that in 1666, the Black Plague, they lost 15,000 people a day. Mm. Hi, Scott McLeod. We're going to get Scott on the show sometime soon to talk about not so much about the America's Cup or about American magic. For for which for whom he is the commercial director. Uh, Lisa Zhu is watching. Oh, good. That's nice to see you on. And she, of course, is Chinese. She's been, I think, mostly living in the UK. The Olympic silver medalist or gold gold medalist, I guess. Gold medalist. Yeah. In in what, Richard? In the um, uh, radio. Pretty sure it's laser. Um, radios or boards. Yeah, laser radio. So. Uh, so and Russell Green is watching and trying to get Russ to come on here soon to help out with the topic that we're going to talk about, not today, but in, in a future show. Um, okay, a lot of folks on here. I'm not going to name everybody, but 
Hey, Robert Babcock. Hello, Robbie. Nice to see you on here. Daniel Grun Richard is right, Tom, that traveling for the Olympics can cause major headaches. Yeah, I'm sure we're, we all appreciate that. Uh, is the New Zealand surrogate boat the boat that will be used for the youth AC program? No. Not even close. I mean, that's we're going to talk about that in a second. Different project. And Jean-Jacques Grandchamp is on. Thank you, Jean-Jacques. Okay, let's carry on um, to this day in history. I have a little bit of music for this. Huh? Some of you made fun of this. <laughs> this day in history, the 14th of February, 2010. I'm sure most of you know what happened. We promoted a bit on Tuesday. Ten years ago today was the finish of the last race, the second race of the In 33rd the of the finish, race two, America's, America's Cup. Cup. 33 and USA BMW Oracle set to win race two and the America's Cup. But Alinghi is flying a red flag, a protest flag. What will they do? Will they protest? Will that influence and change things for the outcome of this race, for the outcome of the regatta? But as things change, as they stand at the moment, after two and a half years of controversy and litigation, finally, America's Cup 33 has been decided on the water. February 14, 2010, Valencia, Spain. The America's Cup is America's again. BMW Oracle with their Trimoran USA, an amazing wing sail, skippered by James Spittle, wins race two to make it USA two, a lingy nil in this unique deed of gift match best of three. So subject to the red flag protest from Alinghi, the Valencian Sun sets on the seven-year tenure of Alinghi, Ernesto Bernarelli and his team representing Society Nautique Geneve. And after 15 years of the America's Cup away from the United States, first in New Zealand from 1995 to 2003, and then in Europe for the last seven years, now the America's Cup returns to the United States, this time to the Golden Gate Yacht Club San Francisco. You got to love Peter Montgomery. Absolutely. He, you know, he, he, he obviously had written that out on the assumption that, that we were going to win that second race, which happened, as I said, 10 years ago today. And, you know, the racing, I, I, what'd you think, Richard? I, I was actually pleasantly surprised the racing was closer than I thought it was going to be. Um, well, I mean, it was a remarkable series. Uh, in what happened in the first race, and the victory um, largely because, to the you know, that was the first time we really saw um, the power of the wing on that on that first beat when they came from so far behind. So I just sailed straight to the left. So that that same straight from that other way. Uh, you know, that, that was, you know, speed with capital S. The, um, what happened in the second race wasn't really a surprise after that. Um, surprising thing was that this was, you know, finished in the dark in the way they did. And, uh, as you see, the, uh, the on the boat shots, I mean, all the that lights were on and, and everything. Well, okay, enough of all that. That, of course, 10 years ago today, congrats to the team that did win it. And I, I don't know where I found that video. It wasn't one that I had, but the team that was on the boat, uh, it, it, was a, it was a rough ride, actually, because we started out we as a team, and I was with the team from the get-go. We lost, in, of course, in Auckland, as you know, Richard, in 03, and then uh, again in 07. And then finally won it in the deed of gift match in 2010 and won it that successfully defended in 2013 and then lost it, you know, pretty quickly in 2017. Mm -hmm. And the only club, as you know, the only club that has not successfully defended it at least once after they won it. In fact, the first time after they won it was Royal Perth Yacht Club in 1987. Mm -hmm. Now the Kiwis won it. Here in well, here down down the coast in San Diego, in 1995. 
successfully defended it in 2000. And then when Russell and his tight five left to go to Alinghi, then lost it in 2003. What do you think historically that tells us about this match now that the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron is the first team to win it, first club, you know, essentially a lot of the same guys, mm. Russell Green, who's watching, has been involved, to win mm. it, lose it, and then win it back? Well, statistically, I mean, you'd have to say that the odds are very heavily in favor of the, you know, New Zealand winning it. Um, but the thing is, too, is that this is probably the toughest cup that we've seen in terms of challenges. I mean, normally, you know, if you had 12 challenges there, I mean, you might get four of them out of that, that 12 that were super competitive. But I don't think, you know, really we've seen challenges like we've got now that are so well funded, been in operation for, you know, the full cycle. And, um, you know, it's going to, going to be hard. Well, we arguably, uh, and, and, arguably and they, had that. got a tight series. Well, say that again. And they've got a tight challenger selection series with this, you know, deal that came out the other day because, you know, what normally happens in a challenger selection series, I mean, there's maybe one or two, you know, in a, in a 12 challenger round, there's probably one or two hard matches in there and the rest of it's kissing your sister stuff. So everyone well, knows what the outcome is. Well, we'll see one? because, you know, you say that, that – that there are three well-funded teams and they all look pretty competitive. This I remember here in 2013, it looked like there were three well-funded teams, three competitive teams. And that was a yawner ETNZ clobbering the other two Artemis and Lunarosa, and then getting up eight one before, of course, Jimmy and co came back and, and hauled them in. But, uh, in 2013, they weren't competitive. Say again, 2013, they weren't competitive. Well, that's my point is that, but, but they were, you had three teams that were well-funded and on paper, at least they sort of oh, look like the three yeah. teams we've got for this one. But they've and been I, doing the wrong things right from the outset. I mean, you know, I mean, Luna Rossa came into it very late, bought the team New Zealand design, um, sailed it for a bit, looked okay, put it in the shed and it came out going slower than it went way down. Well, that's right. I mean, and we'll see, yeah. there's some mistakes being made that we don't know about as we speak. So let's oh, let's get, we're going to get into all one, that. One, one of them is being made, which is that the teams aren't down here sailing now, well, even in a prototype boat, which is a year out from the cup. And I mean, to me, that's a pretty vital time to be at the venue. Yeah, and I I don't disagree with that. But remember, Dennis Conner didn't show up to Fremantle until the bitter end. He he trained no. in Hawaii on his own, and that was a different time. But that may have been yeah, a, a but good that strategy. Was, that was open water, and he also picked a space of water that was mimicking Fremantle, yeah. the same as the Kiwis did in 2017 when they turned up, but these courses are all inshore. It's nothing like what you had in 2000, 2003, where you're out in the open sea. That's a good point. This has got plenty of tides and um, really weird wind directions, and you've got to remember, too, that Auckland's surrounded, I think, by 23 volcanoes, so when you get a a breeze blowing through those, it's it's all over the place. Is Dean Barker going to be uh, local knowledge for Terry Hutchinson and New York well, Club's American Magic? Yes, but, I mean, you've got to really get in there and get your head tuned up. And, um, I mean, I, you know, when I started sailing with my old man, I mean, we never had a, an engine on the boat, and um, he certainly knew the fast way to get home. Hmm. Okay. Um, Let's uh, let's cover a couple other things, and then we're going to go into the cup in depth and the conditions, which have now for the match, which have been issued. So I just want to comment on uh, here. I'll pull you out, Richard, of the PIP there. Uh, a apropos the discussion we're having about the four world championships that are going on in down in Melbourne, in the Melbourne area, the 2020 Worlds for the NACRA 17, the 49 and the FX. Uh, Wrap up today in Geelong. The leaders in the NACRA 17 are the Aussies, Nathan and Haley Outeridge. So they moved since Tuesday. They moved them second up to first. And in the 49er, the Austrians, Benjamin Bilstein and David Hussle. And the Brits, Charlotte Dobson and Saskia Tidy, topped the table going into the final day in the 49er FX. And today, Saturday, is the final day. They've got two. Uh, they, they didn't race yesterday. In fact, you see in this picture. You can see how unsettled the conditions were. They had thunderstorms and they had 
I, a wind, and then they had no wind and back and forth. So today they're going to try to do a couple more fleet races of the remaining schedule than the medal races for those three classes, and we'll see if that actually happens. Uh, also in Australia, the World Championships, the laser class are due to finish in Melbourne on Sunday, and the German sailors we mentioned a minute ago, Philip, Philip Buell is leading, and he's had a bunch of firsts. He's been doing very, very well ahead of France's Jean-Baptiste Bernas. And that information, courtesy of the Tip and Shaft newsletter, which, again, it comes out on Friday once a week. It's free. You can subscribe to it. It's French-based, but they do an English-language version. And they have a lot of well-organized, pithy information like this clip we've just read to you that covers what's, what's happened, what's about to happen, and some interesting links and tips and, and long interviews, including this long interview. I want to give a bravo Zulu to... Huh? A bravo Zulu. That's our bravo Zulu music, really. <laughs> to, to Tip and Shaft for this interview that they did with none other than Max Serena, who is the sailing, he's, he's the team director for Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli. And a couple of interesting things I pulled out of that interview. One is, Max, what are you looking forward to seeing in terms of technique development on the race course? He says, I think we need to see the pre-start. Everyone is doing their own thing and are using the chase boat to recreate the circling boats or stuff like that. I think there is still a lot unknown on the pre-start because the first time in a while we are going to start upwind. So I think we need to see how much you can really do in terms of pre-start. I'm pretty sure if you are able to have one of the boats going off the foil, there is a great shot at being the race winner. If your opponent goes off their foils pre-start, I think somehow we are going to see, again, like a Lee Bow or a type or a tight to lured pre-start type of starting. Richard, what say of uh -huh. you? <clears throat> well, I think, firstly, I mean, the teams will be thrashing this one to death in the simulator. Um, the other thing is that, you know, what he's saying in the pre-start is correct, but where you go on the first tax even more um, uh, relevant because what you've then got to look at doing is looking at where you're doing your, your first tack to, to come back. And um, if you've got yourself into an area where there's less pressure, mm. even though you've won the start, you're going to have you, you know, come off the foils and that. So that's going to be expensive. And the, um, you know, when we look at a chart further on of the race course, I mean, um, particularly the inshore one and the, and the one they've named as one number one priority, um, that's, you know, it's like a golf course. It's full of sand traps. Well, coming off the foils is going to be dangerous at any. I well, mean, it's, it's not. It's not just that. I mean, you have your hand forced by the, um, you know, the surrounding landforms, and not just, you know, they're blocking the blocking the water, but you know, what they're doing to the wind. I mean, you know, sitting there under North Head and a and a sou'wester. I mean, there's a, a huge sector there that's got you know very much reduced wind, and if you get in there, um, you you will come unstuck. Okay, well, we're going to talk about that in a sec with you. You're going to take us through those five course areas. Let me go back to Max and pull out another quote from that interview in Tip and Shaft, which you got. You, come on, guys. you got to love the name of that newsletter. You do. Oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> Tip it's, and it's, Shaft. It's, it's based, based, based off a of hydrofoil. I know, but it's still funny. So uh, what do you see as the relative strengths of the teams, Max was asked. I think, to be honest, the strongest team is Team New Zealand for two reasons. One, because they are a good defender, even when we've been together in the class rules for this yacht. For sure, they were very clear in their minds with an idea for the boat before we even started to put together the class rules. So for sure, there's an edge for them. The Americans are doing very well again. I don't know in terms of pure performance, but the boat end is really good. So they are doing a really good job in boat handling, which is something that we say here over and over based on what, you know, one hears. Then he goes on to say, and the English have also had a really good step forward in terms of sailing and boat handling as well. It's not too, doesn't sound to be too uh, keen on the boat 
And, of course, they have hooked up. We all know they have, even though Max in this interview said he didn't. I think there is no experience with this boat. There is no reference from the past, meaning the class, the AC-75. So it's really a big unknown in terms of how they're going to perform once we put the four boats in the same space of water. And notice he's not talking about another challenger. He's talking about three challengers and Emirates, Team New Zealand. Richard. Well, he's sort of making a big play for the underdog position, which is what they all try and do. Um, the other interesting thing out of all that, though, is that uh, was whether the, the teams for their second boat come out with the same type they had in their first. So, in other words, whether the, the Brits come out with a, another scale, whether they ship to a skiff, um, and same for vice versa. I mean, there's arguments both ways. Because what's going to happen in um, Calgary is that they're going to get the line up there for the first time. It's probably going to be one type that's uh, better than the other, clearly. And uh, at that point, they're all know that they're too late to change the options for boat two. Which so, which do you like better? Do you like the skiff version or the canoe with well, the, of, of what ETNZ and especially their new boat, the, the little test boat, and Luna Rosa Pradaprelli, or do you like the scows? of uh, American Magic and Enios Team UK? Um, well, I've only ever seen a skiff sailing, and, and you can't really tell anything off a video. Um, I mean, you look at the ones I've seen, the videos I've seen of Team New Zealand, I mean, they're quite different to what you see, you know, in the flesh. Are you going to so, be in Colliery? No, uh, well, I'm seriously looking at it, yeah. Well, I hope there's some TV. I'm sure there will be. Uh, some. Yeah, I'm sure. Sure, there is. Yeah. Um, I mean, I hope you can get out in the water as well, which I'm assured is the case. Well, so. there's these two boats that are in. We all know that Ineos Team UK is training alongside of Prada Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli in Cagliari, and there's been a lot made of these boats in the ride height and how much lower three of the four boats sail the other three sail, then Ineos Team UK, which seems to be quite a bit higher off the water. And generally mm. speaking, you want to have a low rider for aerodynamic reasons, right, Richard? Um, yeah, someone explained why, why low is better in these than, the, than high. I mean, a lot of it is, you know, when you get up high and you um, you see them that, I think, the American Magic shot, or, or no, sorry, as a shot I was looking at in... Um, a replay from Bermuda of a heavy weather race with GVR versus mm. Team New Zealand, and you could see the boats when they got up too high; they just suddenly shot sideways. So that's, that's a, there's no there's no no advantage in being high. Um, exactly. And the other thing in these boats is if you get too high, and as you see that American Magic um, shot of the mule, I mean the um, the if the rudder breaks, rudder wing breaks out of the water, you're in dire straits, and you just um, trip straight over the front foil, mm. which, um, you know, if you... And the, the other thing that people don't really sort of realise with these boats is that the um, rudder on the AC-75, I think, is about another metre and a half deeper in the water than it was on the um, AC-50. So the AC-50, it was always on that you could, uh, you know, pull that rudder out of the water quite easily. I mean, I... Saw Ben Ainsley go into a massive nosedive and probably eight to ten knots. Mm. So it wasn't just a, and he, he was sailing along perfectly normally, and then suddenly, you know, the windward hull got up, the rudder came out of the water, and the pressure can't have been quite right on the leeward hull, and that popped up next, and then bang, he was into a nosedive. And when you measured the splash on it, I mean, it was um, three times the width of the boat. It was just just huge. Mm. So, um, yeah. Okay, let's stop there. Julia, I'm sure there's a lot. I see there's a ton of comments yeah. out here. And good thing you're here, Julia, to follow. And what, uh, what questions or comments do you want to? Um, what, what those question? roses, we should have those roses in here every day. We should get, to get, a, huh? get a fresh pot of roses. Those yeah. look really nice. That would be all right with me. Ray Wolf says, what have you heard about the Brits being slow when lining up against Prada? Full rumor. Figure you would know the scoop. Well, we've talked about that, as you know, Richard, on the show. And we, I played those that series of photos that one of our friends took and sent to us. And you know, you can read a lot into it or nothing into it. 
But until, as Richard says, you get lined up during this regatta in Colliery here at the uh, early part, end of, end of April, actually, uh, last weekend in April, how, what do we really know, Richard? Well, I talked to the photographer that took those shots, and he said he couldn't tell who was uh, gaining and who was losing because of the, um, the angles. So I sort of tend to say, well, you know, you, you've got to wait till you get on the water to, to really tell. And also you can't tell who's sandbagging and who's not. So, okay. That's um, exactly. you know, they just all play games. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Well, there's the answer. I, I think that's the best answer any of us can probably make. Let's get into the specifics now, Richard, of the America's Cup, the 36th edition of the oldest trophy in sport, international sports anyway. And on uh, a couple of days ago, the match conditions were released, were published on the 12th of February. And then I, this... I, I found them and then they published them. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> you found them on that, uh, on that, um, I was, I was digging through looking for, um, something else that I was doing a story about on, um, predict wind and all the new weather stations they've got up and, um, suddenly flipped onto the index on the back there. And so oh, there's two new notice of races up there. What's that? Yeah. On the, on um, the they do uh, have a bulletin board website where yeah. they put this stuff uh, up. That was dated the 6th. Apparently it only been up for a couple of hours or three or four hours. Yeah, mm. I mean, they were actually, the, the mediation concluded more than a week ago, right? And then, yeah, well, I mean, you could tell off that there was actually a mediation and it was settled because it had gone to a hearing. It wouldn't have um, been done and dusted that quickly. Exactly. Well, let's get into the details here. And I, this is actually, I'm just we're going to read the the essentials from the release itself that came out a couple of days ago. Following a successful mediation, the America's Cup defender and challenger record have come to an agreement on the match conditions. The two sides came to a consensus after engaging in an official mediation process run by the America's Cup arbitration panel. Chairman David Tillett, our old friend from Australia, as part of the agreement, the wind range for racing in the America's Cup match will be 6.5 at the low end to 23 knots. That's the match. The agreed racing schedule for the match, that's the finals between the defender and the challenger, ultimate challenger, has two race days, two races per day planned for March 6, 7, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, and additional reserve days have been scheduled, but the intention is to complete the event on the weekend of March 13, 14, weather permitting. Racing is planned from 4 p.m., as has been said all along, uh, 1,600 onwards each day. The winner of the America's Cup match will be the first team to score seven points and Richard there's nothing really new in there that we haven't known that we haven't in fact predicted including uh, I predicted what the this little I guess you'd call it a uh, compromise that came out on the wind limits are you surprised by any of this um yeah quite a lot of it actually the um when you when you look through it, I mean, I've gone through it and plugged the reserve days, and there's um, no race days in there before each series. Um, so that's a bit of a surprise. The way the um, say say, say this, that again. There's no race days. There's reserve days, and there's no race days. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. That's not unusual. Um, no, but you'd think they'd have done them all as had them all as reserve days. And then, you know, worked it out from there because, I mean, the way that we've seen the weather this week, it would have been a um, certainly a struggle to get the, the series away on schedule and that stuff. So, you know, even even though they're starting at 4 p.m., I mean, there's been days here when it's been just completely windless till 2 in the afternoon, which was, you know, what the case was on Tuesday when ETNZ went out. Um, and they'd, they'd had the boat on the water from 10 o'clock waiting. Well... Uh, we're going to get into those specifics in a moment too. Here is some more from that same release following uh, here, this, this slide, the parties also agreed on certain conditions in respect of the product cup due to be issued. These conditions are to be issued for the, for the challenger selection series, AKA the product cup by June 30th, 2020, the racing will consist of four round robin sessions over January 15, 16, 17, 22, 23, 24 and followed by a repechage round over 29, 30, 31 in February 2nd with the first to seven points product cup, which obviously is emulating the match 
Product Cup final taking place over the 13th through the 22nd of February, with, again, the match starting on March 6th. Now, they also say here that the following wind range has been agreed for the Challenger Selection Series, the Product Cup, which used to, of course, be called the LV Cup. Round Robins and the Repisha 6.5 to 21 knots, so a little less, trying, I guess, to uh, e equipment wear and tear, keep that to a minimum. The Product Cup will emulate the match and will likewise have a 6.5 to 23 knot wind limit. And in addition, the parties also confirm course location guidelines, which I'm going to run through here, Richard, in a second. Are you surprised by any of that? Uh, well, you've got to look at the whole picture, which, you know, we'll come to. But, I mean, the surprise, yeah, we'll come to, come to it. No, but specifically, are you surprised well, by the, the uh, challenger uh, wind limits here? Of, of six, um, six well, and a half to 21 in the rounds, Robin, and the repishage, and then six and a half to 23 in the product up final I mean, same I mean, as the they're, match they're, they're being pretty cute having a having a wind limit that low when they know that those boats are racing in 60 knots apparent so um you know and e even at 20 knots true they'll, they'll get into that area so quite what the difference of dropping one or two knots at that level is um you know neither here nor there i mean we've seen team new zealand out sailing perfectly comfortable and way more than that um so i, I don't know what their issue is to be honest Plenty of reserve days in there. Uh, there's plenty of no sale days in there. Um, I mean, the only only real key to it is basically who, who's the one that goes straight through to the final out of the um, qualification round. Okay. Well, let's look at the schedule now. I'm going to go through the paperwork. Here's what the actual notice to competitors looked like as issued by Laurent Esquier on behalf of COR. COR slash D is a term we've been using since the 90s for challenger record slash defender the mutual consent so the actual race calendar for those of you starting to plan your travel down there it is product cup round robins the 15th through the 24th of january then the repishage and what what i'm gathering the repishage is it's you know it's french it comes from from uh, fencing well it's used in rowing as well a lot uh, it's used in hockey it's used in a lot ice Explain hockey it though. okay so thank you julie so what it means is that you have a second chance. You go through the rounds robin, and what I think is going to happen is the first place team coming out of the rounds robin will advance directly, advance directly to the match or the, the product cup, rather, the finals of the Challenger Selection Series. The other two teams will go down to the repishage, sail some more, and whoever wins that then will go back to face the ultimate in, in, the, in the product cup for the finals of the product cup. So these other two teams, while they are not eliminated, it's now sudden death for them. Uh, Richard, well, you, you no, have a different take it's, on it's, that. It's first to win four in the repishage. Yeah. Yeah. And then right. they're gone. So, but I mean, the point of the whole thing is that the, um, you know, group of them stay racing th through to early February, which is, you know, it's good, it's good for spectators and good for the fans. So totally agree. Okay, so here is the actual Challenger Selection Series. Now, Richard, you've got a different take on this than I. It's round robin one, round robin one, race number two, round robin one, race number three. Virtually everyone else in the world who's looked at this carefully and thinks thought about it mm -hmm. says to them, you got only three teams in there. Round robin one, race one is A versus B. Race two is A versus C. And race three is B versus C. Now, you've got a different take on it. Well, I mean, I sort of saw what people were saying about that, and I initially thought the same thing when I um, read it through. But when you sit down and work it out on a piece of paper, I mean, the key with uh, that um, published schedule is that from the way I looked at it, one boat raced um, two races on the day, so the 15th of January. And um, uh, the other two, I needed one race on the day. Yeah, right, so that means so when you when you come to put the four races, so that means basically the one's got boat's got two races, the other two have got one. You've still got slack in the series, which you can then plug a plug a fourth challenger. Richard, into. Richard I, I don't know, I, I don't understand why you are so intent to keep long you personally 
are so intent to keep Long Beach Yacht Club in this thing and alive. I don't understand why Long Beach Yacht Club doesn't have a, 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 a Stars Plus Stripes Team USA doesn't have a snowball's chance of getting there. And if by some some harebrained scheme they did get there, they're not going to be competitive. And and now you're reading this thing with all due respect, and I, I love you to death, but I, no one else that sees this reads it the way you do. They say three races per round robin, four rounds robin, and they say – a versus B, A versus C, B versus C, A versus C, B versus C. How, how well, do you read it I, any other way? I, I wrote it out. But I mean, the point with Stars and Stripes is there's still a need to challenge it. And if you go back and look at Ben Ainsley, I mean, it took him a, a month to stitch up the biggest sponsorship in sailing. So um, you can't discount anything. And the, and the cup, it's always full of surprises. <laughs> okay. And okay. It was, and, and it's, not, it's not over till it's over. I give you full marks for. Well, for... it's not. I mean, it's just it's you got to boat a team in there. That's the fourth team they've entered. They've paid a million dollars entry fee. The jury's told them that our, our panels told them they don't have to pay any um, more money until they start racing. Um, you know, they're still there. They're not dead. I... I, I I get you. I hear it, but I and hear it. But, so, but on the so, other hand, you so know what? they haven't paid the entry fee for Colliery. They know the the yeah. protocol says, and they haven't amended the protocol on this point. Yeah. That that if they don't front up, they can't race, and they're done. Any team that doesn't front up to these pre all three of these pre regattas, and you know they 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 keep telling us is this sponsor and that sponsor. We we know who they are, and we call the people up, and and they say sorry, it's it's not happening. So, I I don't oh. what here's what help me understand this. What is the motivation at this point? I understood a year ago why ETNZ and our Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron and you and others close to, close to the the operation down there wanted to have as many teams as possible, and were a, a, a apologists, frankly, for these other teams. There were two other teams besides Stars and Stripes, Stars Plus Stripes. What is the motivation now for trying to keep them around and look like they're in the mix? Doesn't it just hurt the cup? No. No one's... <laughs> How does it help? I, 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 well, I, I digress. But um, it, the thing is that they're, they're a, a valid team. They've made a valid challenge. It's been accepted. And as you should know of all people, that once you've accepted a challenge in, in the cup, there's certain requirements that go with that you've got to stick to, and you just you can't score someone out till they, they decide to get out. Richard, or, the, or they're let, let me try again. You, you, what is why is everybody in New Zealand seemingly so keen to have them still in the mix, even though you know full well they're not going to make it? Is it does it help with the city council? Does it no, help? What, doesn't what's make it a help with? A difference because it's it's just, making a joke out of. The sport, yeah. and it, it, you know, it's sort of like I, I'm sorry to say this is like, and I was involved in it. It's like the three boat semifinal in San wow. San Diego in '95, and you know, it seemed like an I good idea when Bill Center proposed it, and it, it made a laughing stock out of the sport and the cup to say nothing of SDYC, and that's what's happening but now. But as you full well know, I mean, you look at that incident. You, you look at what happened at the. Um, end of March in, what, 2016, when Luna Ross has suddenly, you know, found the boat was being changed from an AC-62 to an AC-50, and inside a week they were out of the cup. You know, there's all these things can change, and if you you look at the history of the cup, nothing is, happens at what you expect to see. It's well, always expect the unexpected, and you don't know what okay. those guys got on the bag. Some billionaire could come through, decide, look, these guys are a great cause. Here's 50 million. They go to the um, challenger record and defender. They yeah. say, right, well, excuse me. And, and I could from, be the next that. Queen of England too, but not like Well, that. I don't think you will, Tom. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Richard, uh, Jay Hanfield is saying the motivation is to make Grant's decision to go to these hugely expensive boats look like the right decision. It's clear that with only three challengers, it's, you know, it's telling. Well, when you see these boats race in flesh, uh, you'll realize why they're in there. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't they're, disagree they're with you. They're fantastic to watch. It's an amazing spectacle, I, I, and, and you've got to start somewhere. I get that, but I still don't understand why dragging the, the – not calling, you know, cutting fish on well, this one, cutting – What 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 is it, What difference does it the, make? What's, what's it, Julia? Cutting – 
cutting, you know, I, I know we have in Michigan, we have an expression, you know water, get off the pot, but cut yeah. fish or bait, cut bait or fish, what is that? Yeah. What's that expression? Yeah. What is that expression, cut. Richard? I don't know, it's your, 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 your analogy. <laughs> I've never heard of it. Cut bait or fish. <laughs> cut bait or fish, maybe that's it. I, I obviously need more coffee. Um. Uh, oh, cut, well, I, fish I or know. cut bait, fish that's or it. Cut bait. Yeah. Yeah. It just finally came back to me. Clark Chapin's asking, have they legalized cannabis <laughs> in Auckland? No, there's a, ref there's a referendum coming up for that, and the way that it's um, heading, it doesn't look like that's going to go through. So but you, there is euthanasia, looks like it will. So, you, you, you know, maybe. Euthanasia? They, yeah, maybe they. But yeah. not cannabis. Yeah. Interesting how different cultures. Julia? Um, Daniel Grun is talking about the real game, game changer is that you can't mode your boat for any specific weather conditions anymore. Your configuration has to be fixed 120 hours before each no. series starts. Well, that's not quite true. Let's carry on, and, and that's a good question or a point, and we'll get to that in a sec. Uh, Richard, let me just carry on here with the slides as we prepared them. And this one is the match dates. And it, again, four in the afternoon, so the wind is more stable then than it was when we raced down there in 2000 and, and in 03. Two races a day. And we know they're, uh, give or take 30 to the you know, max they can be is 45 minutes because that's the time of them. We'll show you that in a second. Starting Saturday, March 6th, it's first to win seven, so it's the best of 13. And if it goes 6-6, six, six, it might end there on the Monday and that'll be <laughs> it'll be a big day in New Zealand, won't it? Um, well, the other day when New Zealand wins it, it'll be a big day, and the, <laughs> if New Zealand lose, it'll be um, yeah, no one want to know. Okay, it just it's it, the rest of that is kind of surplusage. Now here's yeah. the time limits, the intended time limits, and it'll be confirmed the SIs for the first leg is 12 minutes. So if you don't f complete the first leg, that first upwind leg. Uh, that, that is said to be 1.2 miles. Mm. Is that all the distance that leg is going to be? Well, I think the whole thing's likely to be variable around a, um, you know, a time limit and a TV slot. Um, that's the only way you can do it. Okay. And that's exactly what they did in um, in Bermuda, yeah, Bermuda. And, and a lot of the systems they're using here are similar to what they used in Bermuda, which you know went off very well. Okay. Well. The time limit for the entire race is 45 minutes. And we had that time limit run out once here in, or similar time limit. I can't remember what the number was. Ran out here in, as you, I'm sure, yeah. plainly yeah. remember, in San Francisco. Yeah. And when T E T and Z were way ahead in a light air, light fluky day. And that would have ended the thing. Yeah. But, but it did not. Okay, so that's the time limits. Now let's look at these course areas, and you're the expert. Uh, certainly for us, you have been, and thanks very much. But there are these five different areas, and now as as guidance to the teams, because they all want to know where this thing's going to be run and why, the suitability of the indicative locations for the match within course areas in order priority. So, Richard, mm -hmm. should I? we've got these four areas. And obviously, yeah. it has to do with sea state and suitability, wind direction. I don't do, do we don't need to go into the details of this. I should switch. Well, switch. The, the, the only one that's really affected by sea state is priority two, which is course A, um, which is you know exposed. Well, let me get to the chart, and you can explain all mm. that. So the, here's the the one chart, and then I've got this other chart, as you know, uh, right yeah. there. Which one do you yeah. want to start with? Uh, we'll flip back to you. Just, I mean, the key things to look at in that chart of the area is the um, area around Motor Korea. Can you, can you just go back to it? You want to go back to your? Yeah. Okay. This chart. Yeah. So when you look at, um, you'll see, you can see that white ringy Taylor channel there, which is pretty obvious. And then there's a the big white patch and, um, you know, off, off North Head there. But the key to that is just, just to the right of it, you'll see there's a, a lighthouse. Okay, hang on, so hang on, Rich. We're going to do some drawing on here. First of all, you're talking about... Well, it's, it's, it's where that sort you're of... You're talking about this, this channel right here. Yeah. Okay, that, so, yeah. and we go out past the Rangi light, the Rangi Toto yeah, light. Yeah, Rangi yeah. Toto over here is the volcano. Yeah. And, and there, there's that, circles. 
Sorry. Bear in mind that's bear in mind that is six hundred and forty feet high or something. So that's a huge block in the course. Indeed. And it's also it's you know the width that it is, but also that is all. It's only seven hundred years old. This is this, all, this all, yeah, over here. It's all all black scoria. So when you get very high temperatures like we've been experiencing, you get a huge heat uplift off that um, whole island. So if you imagine a, you know, like the Great Wall of China or something like that extending right right across the island, that's the size area that's heating up, and then it, those rocks are phenomenally hot. And does it draw the breeze in off the water? Well, it's a huge, huge. I mean, like this from all different directions, like this? It does. No, it doesn't draw it in that way. What it does is it affects it coming the other way. So when you've got a sea breeze, it'll come in and it'll from blow. Down, a sea breeze from down, from like this? From, from, from a sea breeze coming from the right. Oh, from so the one, right, like this? Yeah, so it can come in where you've drawn that second angle, arrow, and yeah. then suddenly uh, decide that it's going to flick around and, and, and come from the first direction. Okay. So that's a, a major, major influence there. But the course so that, areas, these, these course areas are here, here. Yep. No, 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 no. These no. are not course areas? They're, they're course areas. But if you take that first one you drew, that's course C. Yeah. So that's so here, let uh, me go. One. Let me go back to that chart oh, because okay. the, your chart's help, more helpful. Go ahead. Okay. So a few um, – the area there with course C is the priority one course. So, course C is the priority inside North Head almost. I mean, between yeah, the port. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Wow. So if you if you then take what I just said about Rangi Toto, and you know realize that it's also got another island on the back of it. Yeah. Which is quite substantial as well. It's not as high as Rangi Toto. So when you get the wind coming in from the east or the the, the a sea breeze coming from the east then obviously that volcano, the hot rock, and everything like that is a, a huge impact on that course C. Yeah. Right? If you go out to course A, which is the number two priority, that influence is, is nothing like that. In fact, it's almost non-existent because the way the wind comes through there, course A, it's very easy to actually get it to windward of that island. So um, there's a bit of an issue there as you go, go close to it. But the other thing you get flowing out through that channel, of course, is, is tide. And that can be quite a big influence. Okay. Not so much in strength, but the direction. Of course, C is where most of the Louis Vuitton Pacific Cup was run, right? Uh, yeah, the Pacific Trophy, yeah. It was yeah. there or maybe a little bit. Uh, it, was, it was where the Citizen Watch match racing yeah. series used to be held. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So then we you, the next course you get on is priority three, which is course B. So what they've said in that, it's only going to be used in a um, basically a wind direction that blows straight up and down that channel, which is relatively rare. Um, and then probably the more common course they would get off to if they got some rough water is to go into course D or certainly off into course E. So when you get over into course E, um, you can see there that it's virtually landlocked. Yeah. So but that's for that's for this breeze, the direction, th this kind of a breeze, right? Well, no, the, the more common one they'd use that on if they um, had to is it was blowing 25 knots from the, um, from the east or a sea breeze. You can get in there and it's still, you know, very fl flat water. Um, there's a bit of tide flowing in there, which creates a chop, which is a problem for keel boats, but it's not really that much of an issue for foilers that are just cutting through it. So what's the deal? Is Are these courses to, to to allow running the races in the lee of land so that it's flat water? The thing I think they're, they're nervous about is sea state. It's sea state, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's your, your first requirement. If you can get straight wind and it's moderately true, then they'll go for that priority one course on C. If there's big influences in it, they will go to um, course A. And if there's uh, a C state running which prohibits course A, it might, uh, sorry, yeah, which prohibits course A, then they would probably look at um, 
you know, running on C, see if they could get away with it there. Otherwise, D comes into play. And then if uh, all else fails, then they go to E. So the, the point with all that is that it, it means that they're protected in terms of the TV schedule because they've been very badly caught out in the past mm. when they've um, been locked into running in that course C, not so much in the Louis Vuitton Pacific series, but um, in the Citizen Match Racing series that used to be also broadcast live on TV. And in fact, that um, whole deal ended when they had a race offer that was particularly pedantic about getting his racing just right. And um, they held the TV up for two hours. And uh, the producer, who was Doc Williams, just threw up his hands in the horror in the end and said, we're out of here. Yeah. And uh, they went back to re not regular programming. And um, he put in a recommendation to his um, management that they never covered yachting again. <laughs> well, Live. so let me yeah. let me just go back to this shot. And for our viewers who have not been to Auckland or were not familiar with or at the 2000 and 2003 cups and julia you were there for what the 2000, 2000. cup when kard's team from st francis yacht club that racing was all out here in the haraki right. gulf right. way out there way out there well it was it, it, there yeah. were three different core three or four even a b c and d i think yeah. Yeah. and it was you know it was basically windward lures and depending upon where the wind was right out here two or three leg two or three lap windward lures out in the haraki Gulf, and now it, it's we've got quite a different landscape here, Richard. But if you you know go back to two thousand and three, the next land from from Rangi Tato was up at uh, you know it's, it's fifteen miles north of that, so it's it's really unobstructed water. Hmm. Um, but with this water here, they're sailing, and it's uh, but you know, for it's, the, like a, it's like a golf course. To be basically. clear, the regatta director, who we originally thought was going to be one gentleman, mm. an American. He is not going to be the regatta director, one hears. Hasn't been announced, and they're working on uh, one of two different people. Have you heard any news on that? No, no, no. I asked, but they wouldn't say. Okay. Well, that's being worked on. So there they are, five racing areas, Alpha through Echo, the Haraki Gulf. I, I hope we get over on the Waiheke Island course, and we can go in there for or start some lunch and some good Waiheke Island wine. And before we um, come out to the race. Well, you can, you can see it from the vineyards, but there's actually pretty good spectator viewing there from um, Eastern Beach. I mean, I went, I went over there and, you know, sh shot the team sailing. I mean, that area E is what they call the paddock. So that's e where e the... E is the paddock. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so when so, you're talking about the... I, I didn't realize I the paddock was D. And uh, when you're taking pictures, are you taking those pictures of yours from North Head with your new super long lens camera? Um, mostly, when you get when you go over the panic paddock, you go over to um, you drive right over to Eastern Beach, which you can see is that sort of white thing. Yeah. In the in the in the, in the bottom there. What, and, what's uh, the yacht club that's over there? Oh, Buckland's Beach Yacht yeah, Club. Buckland's they're Beach. on the um, right. They're further. They're around in the estuary which is coming out of there which you can see which is the tanaki river and they were the um, they were the yacht club that helped the challenger record in 2000 yeah, and yeah, 2000 yeah. okay let's yeah. let's carry on we've seen that anything else on this chart well yeah because this when you when you look at that other chart i mean it looks very flat what you're starting to see in here is the what the you know obstacle courses are on the golf course and um you know the first of them is that lighthouse that you can see there which has been rock so when you look at course C, it looks all lovely like it's, you know, nice bit of open water there. Uh, from the lighthouse uh, to your right, it's all riddled with reefs. So you, you really can't get in there. Um, and if you do go in there, which you, you can for a bit, you've got to come out to uh, avoid that lighthouse. And, you know, again, while you can pass through those reefs, uh, I think you'd be pretty game to do it in a, um, a, a foiler doing well, 40 knots. One of the courses is right there in the Rangi Channel, right? Yeah, this is what I mean. It's, it's, it's like a course there with sand traps. Yeah. Okay. There's plenty of them, and 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 the other thing, even even on that chart, it doesn't show the volcanic cones. So you know, you dot 23 of those around that area, and it's certainly a big influence on the um, course. And now you've got from difference from 2000 to 2003, the high-rise buildings have really gone up in Auckland. So again, they're another big 
um, influence on that wind coming down, which is, you know, the area they want to race, or so the, the wind strength they want to race in, in there is a, you know, nice, you know, 15 knot that's kept blowing straight down the harbour from the direction of the harbour bridge. And uh, it's great that, that suddenly you've got to get a course out there and, you know, fit it in amongst the reefs and the, you know, lighthouses and beacons and every other goddamn thing that's there. Okay, well, they paved paradise and put up a parking lot, to quote. Mm. Who was that, Joni well, Mitchell? Whose song was yeah, that? But, but Course A is, is, is much more straightforward. Um, yeah. Okay, let's go to this. This uh, one of our uh, viewers commented on, on commented on this earlier. The competitors are required. This was in this this uh, conditions that were just issued for the match. Competitors are required to declare confidentially to the measurement committee 120 hours before the scheduled start of the first race of the match. The configuration to be sailed for their yacht. The declared yacht configuration must include the identify, obviously, the hull, the foils, the foil arms, the fairings, the foil wings, the foil flaps, the rudder, the rudder, upper and lower, and the mast tube. And then I grabbed another paragraph after studying this document until I was going cross-eyed. After a yacht configuration for the match has been declared and prior to racing, competitors must obtain a measurement certificate for the match that reflects all the details above. Once a measurement certificate has been issued, it shall not be amended or replaced at any time before or during the match unless a component listed in the certificate is damaged or lost. And Richard, that uh, locks it down. In fact, there's a whole, I didn't put it all in here, but there's a whole bunch oh, of more there's, verbiage. There's, that, two, there's that, two pages of it. Yeah, that clears up. You have to even list your alternate equipment, your foils and yeah. foil arms and rudders, yeah. should it be damaged so that you can't choose horses for courses. You can't have, you can't intentionally break something and expect to get it replaced with. How the, are you going to know? That far no, the, me the measurement oh. you can't that's the other point but the, the measurement committee is pretty clever and the teams of course never would cheat no right no no team would ever cheat on richard any comments on this well i think the well, um with the, the the challenges i'm just trying to find it i'm pretty sure they've got to go through the same declaration um two days before the start of each round so yeah Oh, well, that, before, that's right. But, that also yeah. applies to yeah. the rounds. It's, which is, which is less than 120 hours, obviously, mm. but they're still bound by the same considerations. And the, the issue in there is basically your foil selection because, you know, if you look at the wind limit they've got in there of six and a half knots and the upper limit of 21 or 23 knots, um, you've got to have a foil that's basically a, an all-purpose foil that can operate across that range. An APF. But, you know, we used to have all-purpose yeah. mainsails, and now I see North Sails has just announced mm. an all-purpose jib for the star class yeah. across the old so, wind range. So, so what that means, if you go back to Bermuda, uh, Team New Zealand in particular had a, um, a, a set of light weather foils there that had a, a very high upper range on them. And they had a lot bigger crossover with the light air foils and, and the and the AP foils than the other competitor did. And if you listen to that uh, podcast that um, Shirley Robertson did with uh, Jimmy Spittle, he, mm. he talks about that in there, and they were they were a bit surprised by that. And that's really one of the things that caught them out. So what what that in, means and uh, caught Jimmy Spithill and BMW Oracle. Yeah, no, no, in, in Bermuda. In but, Bermuda, but, right. USA. So in terms of Oracle uh, Team uh, USA. Yeah. So in terms of, you know, what 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 does that mean? I mean it means that the in Bermuda they used to get a forecast um, the night before from their guy. They would make a choice based on that of the dagger board that was going in. They would then uh, the shore team would then fit those in. They would get the measure around, I think it was at half past eight or nine in the morning. He would uh, certify all that and then the boat would go in the water at 11. So it was a, a real, you know, hassle there, particularly when they no, had all, huge, the, all the teams running. Huge harangue, so what, and, and so this, this is forcing the teams to have all-purpose foils. Right. Yeah, got but it. The, the, there's a trick with that, of course, is that with your all-purpose foil, is that you've got to have one that's 
giving you the lift and the light at 6.5 knots. Yeah. But you've also got to have one in there at, at 21, 23 knots. In fact, the weather could even be go higher than that because that's only a, a, only a limit four minutes before the start. So it can go above that. And you've then got to have, you, you're carrying these draggy foils around at the you know the top end of the, the range, end, yeah. which, which affects your speed. So if someone can find a way of basically having a, a foil in the light, which gives you high lift, and then having that, getting that same foil or or whatever you do with that foil in terms of your your wings and your flaps yeah. to um, reduce drag at the top end. Okay, Richard, well, let's no. we we can't get too deep in the weeds here. We've got to carry on. It's, it's a very, very important point it, with that. It, it really is, and that's why I brought it up, and thank you for shedding some more light on it. And let's take a look now at the Hawk. Well, hang on, hang on. There's one other point in there, which is that um, this wind limit is an adjustable wind limit by the tide. So if you go back to that, um, I mean, you know, readers can you know remember what that chart looked like. I mean, you've got tides swirling all around through that race area. It's coming out of estuaries and, and everything else, yet they're using the same. So when you when you look at that tide there, you've got one tidal influence, you know, if the tide's coming in through the Rangitoto Channel. There's another tidal influence coming in between Rangitoto and Browns Island. And then right in the middle of um, course C, you get into the confluence of those two two tides. So you've got a, a, a real no man's land in there. Yet what they're going to do in this um, instruction that they've got is they're going to set the wind limit based on a um, a, a table that the, is going to be produced on the on the 20th of December, showing where the tide's going to be flowing and at a particular time. Yeah, but that's not that's not a surprise. Yeah. I mean, they did that in in San Francisco too, as you pointed out yes. in the in the article yeah. you yeah. wrote yeah. the but other day. Was, if San it, Francisco, it's flowing straight in and straight out. Well, it's a lot easier in San Francisco because yeah, yeah. it was either never ever a flood, yeah. and it was either yeah. with the wind or against it. And this will be quite a bit more complicated. But still, they'll these are smart people, and they'll figure it out. And and well, it it, it plays hell with your TV schedule when you get a a wind in there that the boats are clearly foiling around on. And the race office turns around and says, I haven't reached my minimum yet because of this tide factor. Yeah, well, okay. But, but there's uh, there's bigger problems than that. It's just uh, he may, well, he, he also yeah. has the authority just to say it's it's unsafe. He's, he can also it's say we're not going to run this. It's not the top end, it's the bottom end. And if you're knocking six and eight, you've got six and a half knots there, you knock two, two knots off the okay. tide at a particular time of day, okay, you're but, down to four and a half knots. You've got a condition where the boats can't yeah. sail. Are these boats going to foil in six and a half? Yes, but they won't do it in four and a half. They're going to have to, right? No. They're not. There's, all, you, you phys, there's, a, there's a limit there where you physically can't foil, and so, particularly with this single or all purpose foil that you've got to have. Yeah, but what, all, are they going to foil? My question is are they going to foil at six and a half knots of true wind speed? Just. Just. Just you think? Well, we'll see. I mean, the teams are all the teams are all going to be working really hard to do that if they know it's going to start, but potentially in six and a half, and they're not foiling, and the other team is. Goodbye, bye bye. Yeah, but I mean, you get into that situation that the wind pumps in, which it you know it can do very readily under that uh, four o'clock start. Suddenly, you've got a team that's in there that's got this light weather set of foils. The other guy gets in there, and he's really coming into his own at 11 knots and it's blowing 15. Yeah. Well, that's, that's to say it's the, always been the case in the cup, you know, who's set up and somebody asked the question, will they be able to mow? Well, they will be able to mow. They just can't do a lot of equipment. They can't do any equipment, major equipment. Swap. How, how can you mow it? They will figure out things. Well, they, you can't, the, the gear list there is stuff that you can't change. They will be figuring out some things that will, in effect, mow the boat for a little lighter air, a little heavier air. And they, these well, guys. Well, you, you can't because, I mean, when you go into the rule, I mean, there's a whole list of equipment there that's in the boat weight. So you can't do this trick of taking the sprit off of, like, you know, Oracle did in, tw in 2017. Do you, do you, and, want, and getting it, do you want to have you, another bet? I mean, we've got two, and you, I think I'm up two right now on you. You, you can you can take the sprit off, but what you've then got to do is you've got to carry a compensating weight in the boat. Yeah. So what's the point? Well, and the same with same with the sails that you take off. 
you've got a carrier compensating weight in the boat. So Let's see what there's, happens. There's, there's not a lot of wriggle room. It's all a, The whole thing comes around is getting this full design right so it's got its maximum possible range. Okay, let's let's move on because we're getting again deep in the weeds, and I'm happy to debate this further with you. But tell us about the Hawk. This I, I think this is a really smart move for these guys to develop this boat to, to splash this boat just as they're having to ship the the main boat, the AC75, to Colliery. And this was apparently yesterday. I was sent this picture, and they had gone yesterday, maybe the day before, and they'd gone out with this. What is it, 30? Well, it's 30, 30, 30, 38 foot. 38 it looks like a, about a 28 footer because the, um, you know, the slope of the stern is, um, is such that you don't really pick that up visually unless you, you're close up. But um, I'm not sure what day that was. I mean, the, the last day I saw them go out was on um, Tuesday, and they, they went out at uh, 2 o'clock, and they came back at 7 you know, they, I think this is more recent than that, but no big deal. They 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 went out. They broke something, and it, it, they didn't. You know, normally they tow the boat on its foils. It's up foiling, and they had a long, yeah. slow tow back. I think from what you call the paddock from over there by Waikiki. No, no. Uh, I'm just trying to look at the background. Well, it does, and, it does look, again. They had a long uh, tow back. Yeah. They fixed whatever the problem was, and they went back out late in the afternoon and sailed for a couple yeah. hours. But let's so look. All, let's go all, look at your all, picture. All they're, doing, Where all they're doing with that boat is basically its primary use, I think, is to um, test wings, and you see them stop for a lot of the time where there's a lot of fiddling on around going on, which would indicate that it is wings and flaps that are being played with. Well, tell us about this picture, which is well, your, your picture. This, yeah. So that's what I mean by the, the boat sort of looking like a 28-footer. I mean, you can see from, you know, just behind Glen Ashby there, the boat starts tapering back towards the stern. Um, it's pretty quick. It looks as quick as the AC-75, probably, you know, maybe five knots off and, um, you know, running downwind, uh, going upwind. I don't know. The only thing I've got to gauge off that is I... Um, Saw them do one run back upwind towards me at um, North Head on Tuesday, and I realised I was, had a lot more time to be able to fluff around with lenses and stuff like that without getting caught by this fast approaching boat. So I think it's probably a little bit slower upwind, but it's still a really good test platform for them. And the, and the point with it is that they can, it is a half size AC75, but they can, of course, go back and benchmark that. Um, against the, the AC75 data and then start working out, you know, whether they've got a gain or not and then checking that in the simulator. So, and you think they're testing foils? Oh, I think from what it looks like, they're, they're testing foils flat out. How about, you how, the, Richard, how about flight systems? Well, I'd assume in that that they've got an automatic flight system running. Um, it's probably, probably not a manually one. Um, you know, purely and simply because they've got less crew on board. And that's exactly what they did with um, the AC-50 is they just worked out uh, the best system they could have regardless of the rules, and then they pulled it back to do what the rules said they had to do as a minimum. When they... I just assume that that's what, what, what's happening here. Okay. okay. Anything else on this boat? Um, no, other than, you know, it's just... All the feedback um, I've heard is that the team are extremely pleased with the boat, um, and there's got to be a reason for that. I think essentially that's going to allow them to do what they um, could do under the, um, I guess, the AC75, but no, nowhere near as easily, which is basically go there and test ideas that are, are outside the role, see if they work, and then work out what they've got to do to pull those I extreme ideas back under the rule, um, so they've got compliance. Okay, well, I think it was a smart move, and let's move on to what, I don't know if this was a smart move. They announced this week that they've taken McDonald's on as a sponsor, I guess, of the team, not the event. They took the cup to McDonald's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in some place called Fielding, New Zealand. Yeah. Let's look at the video, and then, uh, then we'll talk about sure. it. Okay. 
here in Fielding, the epicentre of New Zealand, and are pleased to announce a new partnership with Emirates Team New Zealand. Well, it's unbelievable, it's in Fielding, it's, it's amazing. It's, um, it's the home of Simon, and we're really excited to have a, a local who's been a part of the team and a winning part of that team. And uh, he's, he's from Fielding, and we're so excited to have him and the cup here today. McDonald's being a partner, I'm sure there'll, there'll be a, a further reach for them and the America's Cup is far and wide reaching and there's a lot of supporters throughout New Zealand that may not get to Auckland to watch the Cup and it's pretty cool to bring it to the people in the regions and bring some fruits back of the hard work that we did in Bermuda. We as a family brand we are really excited to be a part of this and to share it with families all around New Zealand and really, we're really excited that in fielding that we can bring that to the families here. Thank you very much. Can I get two kiwi burgers, please? Uh, I'm making a meal, thanks. That's it, thanks. <laughs> Is that normal? He got the cup. That's it. The <laughs> that's great. From my meat. Yeah, that's great. Okay, Richard. Uh, I, I, I don't think Bruno Trouble is going to be too happy with that, <laughs> but uh, what do you think? Well, I like the interesting thing from the purists is apparently they're, they're putting the McDonald's sign on the south of Calgary. So um, that'll be see, see, see who has heart attacks there. But I think what this is really is say so, um, they're announcing it as a family partnership. So effectively what that means is that they can really use that McDonald's relationship, the breadth and length of New Zealand and, um, you know, do promotions around that so that, you know, lifts the, you know, fan support throughout New Zealand and, and doesn't just make it Auckland centric with, you know, those that can want to fight. Yeah, come on, right. that's not the yeah. point. The point is the cup has been associated with Louis Vuitton and Prada and Rolex and Emirates and, I mean, Ineos is a big company. It's now we've got a fast moving consumer good. In effect, we've got a, a restaurant, a fast food restaurant that is sponsoring the team. Okay. I know they need, you know, everybody needs whatever money they can raise, but is this good for the cup? Of course it is. So commercially sponsored team and they're entitled to get commercial sponsors and good on them. What's the difference between getting sponsored by something that's high use like that and getting sponsored by another high use that's an airline. There's nothing exclusive about um, air travel. Okay, well... Why, why, why do you always have to have these things that it's just the rich and the famous? It just reinforces the cup's, you know, reputation as being something that's, you know, beyond the reach of most, which it actually is. Julia, but, well, Julia, but, what, let's see what... When, when you go back and... When you, when you go back, and you look at photographs of what happened in the team parades throughout New Zealand, there's certainly not the rich and famous Rolex wearers that are there. The little old ladies with woolen hats on and all this sort of carry on, um, gone down there for the day, and they just absolutely love the team, and that's what this was all about. Okay, it's getting well, for those people. Okay. And that's how you build I, I, a family. I'm glad, you're still, I'm glad you're still defending the home team. And, I would be surprised and, if you didn't. And... and, and if other countries did the same and have that huge fan base, you'd find there was a lot more teams in the cup and there was also a lot more people in sailing. Julia? Yeah, that's true. I, I've been really concentrating on, on the notes and there are really two themes that have come through, um, one of which is sort of related to this because Sangmaster says two to three years of work settled in less than two weeks and perhaps eight hours of TV, tough proposition for a commercial sponsor and later he says um my point is the duration of the match is hurting viewership would the super bowl will be super if it were only two quarters can't why can baseball command enormous tv rights for games the last that last hours and to some who are terrifically boring to watch the fans are drawn into the personal drama the nuances and the anticipation the, the boats are cool. I fear they lack the grandeur that the cup demands. This is John Sangmus. Yeah. Richard, um, are the boats okay, not sorry, grand sorry. enough? Oh, you've got to be kidding. I mean, um, these are the most jaw-dropping boats that you've ever seen. It's just incredible to watch. I mean, it, it's it's very hard for me to photograph because you you see one of these coming things coming at you and then they're absolutely hitting it. 
and um, the tendency is always just to, you know, drop your jaw, drop your camera, and um, just sit there and watch it go through. But I mean, they're the most staggering boats to watch, and you know, even even just seeing one of them sailing around, I mean, it's just they're, they're amazing. There's something like you've never ever seen before. Takes a, you know, the sport right into Formula One. There, there, where you've got the crashes and the guys doing the runoffs and splashdowns and nose dives and all that sort of thing. Um, it's just incredible to watch. Well, um, we got a bunch of we got a bunch of other comments here. We got Jay Hamfield oh. saying, "I'm not loving it." <laughs> well, he hasn't seen it. I mean, Mark, these, no, no, not the boat. He's or I'm sorry, I'm back on McDonald's. Don Lunabos, McDonald and Coppertone. I mean, you remember when, when Bruno said famously the cup is it's it's now about well, you, cheap you cheap French or no cheap cheap sunscreen and and the smell it, of the smell of something French fries, French, French fries have, and, and the smell of cheap sunscreen. You can't have the conversation where you're sitting there on on one hand moaning about the lack of challenges in the cup. And then you're also moaning on the other that you're not. You've got sponsors in there that aren't playing to the, you know, top end in bracket and everything else. Okay. You take the cup to the people. You will get the sailors in. You'll get the people into sailing. The sponsors will see that there's something in it for them. They're interested. They put money into it and they promote. Well, I'm teasing you a little bit because obviously well, different uh, New Zealand's a different. Uh, uh, kettle well, of fish when it comes no, to sponsorship, but no, no the rea- no. it's interesting though, Richard. The reaction: Mark Husted is saying, "Just great crap food involved with our sport that printed mm-hmm. healthiness." Um, uh, David Stoller, oh no, David didn't say. Fries on the fly. Don Lunabos is saying. Marcus Feinstein, McCup, Mick Cup, Jay Hanfield. The cup will be filled with McNugget dipping sauce. Okay, some of these are just tongue in cheek. Well, they're just idiots. Uh, Stars and Stripes just announced, announced Hooters as a new sponsor. That probably that probably would bring some attention to, to the cup. Well, it would. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, in any event, uh, it's uh, Mark Husted. It was even more uh, pointed. He says it's just stupid having an idiot sponsor, regardless of the money. I right. mean, um, it, it is a you know, Richard J. Hanfields. If I get arrested in New Zealand next year, I want you to represent me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's five lawyers in our family. You can have a choice. <laughs> yeah. Lachi Gilmore. Hello, Lachi. I, I, I'm the odd one out. Yeah. And Pedro Foiling Sailor, uh, Peter Stevenson in Australia, agrees with you. He's saying kids love McDonald's. This will drag kids' interest into sailing worldwide. Stop complaining. Money is money. Okay, that's well, just, good. Just I, I, two, two weeks ago, I judged a, um, a challenge up the Auckland University, which was basically yeah. all these business schools sent a team around. They were given a, a strategy that they had five hours to come up with. I mean, these are really, really bright guys. And the one that I was sitting on was um, how do you get young people into the America's Cup? Well, they had three strategies come up. Two of them involved these video games. And when you put the analysis through those from these really top marketing guys, it just it, it never stood up and, the, and that failure sort out, like I said, a dog's balls. The one that won came through and they had a completely different approach, didn't have a game involved around it. And it's the same with the McDonald's deal. I mean, they will push promotions out there that are aimed at kids, sell the excitement of sailing to kids. And, you know, that's where they get enthused. And then they say, right, well, I want to do more about the sport. I, I see it as something I want to do. I never considered it before. Their mothers love it because it's a non-contact sport. They're not getting the crap beaten out of their little darlings on the rugby field. And away you go. Plus, it's a really good professional sport. And there's people now that have been in it for a lifetime. So, And you can you know. continue in a lifetime. I think they're good exactly. boys to that. Yeah, okay. Let's move off it. I've, I've, I've had my – I've teased you a little bit. And oh. money is money. I think that is that is part of the well, – what's at the root well, of this, whether you'll agree with it or not. But let's move forward, Richard. Um, you know, John Sangmeister's comment notwithstanding, uh, we're doing in the America's Cup what is happening in the next Olympics, which you and I have railed against, which is using experimental boats and events for, in, in at least if world sailing has its way, I do think the IOC is going to stop it, but we'll see. And well, at least have, at least not have so many experimental events, but, um, uh, you know, this is an experimental boat, and the world's never seen something like this. And you haven't seen that happen in the cup before. They've always used established some things. Okay, the IACC in '92 was a rule that we all devised, and everybody said, "Here we go." But it was 
you know, it was a box rule. Well, it, it was a no, big, no, big no 12 meter and a box rule modernized. Yeah, but no one saw a foiling cat till the AC came along, AC-72. Well, fact, that, but the, and, you, and but, you guys tried to stop it. No, with respect, the foiling cats, they were cats, and they weren't, yeah, and they yeah, weren't they, foiling yeah, until the they, Kiwis figured yeah. it out. Yeah, and I mean... That was no a one, development. No one, yeah, it's great. Okay. And I mean, put an edge on it, and it put a different edge on the sport. And the other thing we saw straight out of that was that the... I mean, you were there in San Francisco when... Yes. when Russell first put that AC-45 pitch boulder yeah. in, a, in front of the media centre. It just went flashing around the world. And, I mean, the story that I wrote on that, which you know, I think I got the, the tip from you on that it had gone on, I mean, the Wall Street Journal picked that straight up and, and went in there. And, and, what's, and what is all that, and, and what has all that done for the sport and for the Cup? Is interest it's, growing? It's the, the, do, you, do you perceive that, that interest in the Cup is growing worldwide? I, I perceive that the mainstream sporting public now get the sport and the, the mainstream sailing oh, public, want, want, they want to go back to, you know, banging around in 12 metres, talking about complicated rules, technical nuances and all that sort of thing. Richard, it may be true in a, in a mass of sailing power like New Zealand and maybe in France and maybe in a sailing centre like San Diego, San Francisco and a couple other places, Long Beach, California. And Italy. And Italy. But I don't, I don't see anything that we've done since 07 that's, that's done anything to build up the interest in the cup. In fact, I would say quite the opposite. But the, let, let's... Well, you know, I okay, mean... Okay, one la your, that, your last, your last response. That, but, but that's a function of the court case. Because, I mean, we were sitting there in 2007. There were um, 12 teams in Valencia. It's all ready to keep on going. There's a bit of debate about whether they have an AC90 or not. And then the court case took it out of out of play for um, how many years until 2013? I don't disagree with that. I'm sa what I'm but saying we've, is that nothing. We've never, we've never rebuilt from that. Nothing since 07, and the interest has plummeted. I think within the sailing community, especially. Which and is what you, the court case did. Well, the the court case, but the, it wasn't the court case that started it. It was the fake challenger of record. Yeah, but the, the court case, you know, that was that was why the cup collapsed. If Malingi had it's, not it's, done a fake challenger of record, if they'd done a real challenger record, there would have never been the court case. And there probably would have been a, a 2010 I, Cup in Valencia that would have been spectacular. Yeah, but I mean, the, the thing was that that didn't happen and that case continued on to its, you know, its end. But I mean, that, that is when the Cup collapsed. That's when the audience turned yeah, off. Well, at, at least I think you agree with me that the Cup, the, the worldwide... Uh, Acceptance is not necessarily yeah. growing. We've only got but three that, challenges that, for pizza. But that's why, yeah. But I mean, the the cup has not recovered yet from that court case. Okay, let's let's move on. Uh, I, I can't wait to to break bread with you and have a glass someplace sometime soon. Let's talk about the youth AC. Uh, the entries I note they sent out a release. The entries closing 29th of February. These are these nine meter foiling monohulls that are you know smaller versions of what's mm. to be raced in the cup. And I haven't heard of too many entries. I usually I start hearing from teams that are going to go into the ocean race or go into this event or that event. If they're, I haven't heard much about this. Have you? No, no. I mean, other than that, in the shore lease. I mean, I haven't they, been chasing around about it either. But um, and they talked about running a series in later this year. I mean, this thing's upon us uh, later this year in China. Yeah. And I I doubt that's going to happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, 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 as I said, I've heard nothing about it. And the entry fee is, it's not, you know, it's its 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 big. It's a huge entry mm. fee, so we'll see. Mm. Okay, so you haven't well, heard anything either. There's a big, either. big, big I, cost in those boats as well, so. Say again? There's a big cost in those boats as well, so. Well, exactly. Know, it's, it's just, you know, there's a lot of things. And is it, have, is it happen. true that the Commodore of the club or the immediate past Commodore is the one that's that's backing and building these boats and, and selling yeah. the boats? Yeah. yeah. What, do you think mean, of, it, what do you think of that? Well, that's the Commodore Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron. Yeah, but I mean, he's, um, see, in Cook, I mean, he does a, um, you know, he's got a big boat yard. And um, um, I mean, I guess the implication is that, um, you know, he's, he's making a lot of money out of it, but he does an awful lot of, um, projects in there that are, um, I would say there were certain money losers. I mean, the 
Auckland Classic yacht fleet are in a huge debt, just in you know terms of boats that have gone in there. And oh, it's, it's a tough business. And, and that sort of thing. Well, he's, he's the only 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 yacht builder left in New Zealand. Tough business. And well, we will see. The number of teams, the preliminaries in China, whether this thing even happens in these boats, I guess, is still up in the air. I hope it does. I think the Youth America's Cup's a good idea. Talk mm. about helping to sell it through the sport. Julia, do you have a comment? Oh, there's just – it's a little off, off but it's there's another uh, theme that's been running through comments, which is uh, are the rules fair? And, and uh, Houston says, for one, that's always been the point of the cup. Politics of anything has never been fair. That's the cup. This is Peter Houston said yeah. that? Well, that's true. Julia Vedekin is here. I have Richard Gladwell with us in Auckland. It's a delight to have him on. Clark Chapin tells us, our statistician tells us, it's the 10th time he's been on the show. And the first time, oh, we, had sorry, a, Lena. A, the first time we had a <laughs> Skype visitor, Skype, we had a guest live via Skype was you back in September, as I said at the yes. top of the show, Richard. Thank you for coming on. Let's. And you are going to be go to the top of our, our all time uh, huh. interviews. So I think that's terrific. I think he already is, isn't he? Yeah, he is. OK, let's um, we've done the Youth America's Cup. Now I want to come back one more time to Stars and Stripes, Long Beach Yacht Club. What's wrong with this model? I put this up on my Facebook page the other day, and people said, oh, they do finally have a boat, tongue-in-cheek. But, of course, they can't even get a model built, the scale model built correctly. It's boats on port tack. The windward side foil is down, and the leeward side foil is up. The thing would turn over immediately. Do you have any comments um, on that, Rich? You don't have any comments on I don't know. I mean, it's just a... Just a model. I mean, people read way too much into that. I mean, it's like the guys picking up with the... Um, the poster for Calgary and, and pointing out exactly the same thing on all the boats. So, you know. Well, that was pretty weird, so wasn't it? Oh, well, you know, it's just out of I didn't stick that poster in the show, but okay. That leads us to our question of the day, which is America's Cup related. You know who this is? Well, Dick, you told me pre show. Oh, you did in the tech check. Julie, you know who that is? Uh, y yes. Does yes. this help? Sir Ben Ainsley and his Ineos Team UK, they have a new clothing supplier, and they're, they're pretty pretty flash. I mean, they look like it's kind of Ivy League prepsters here, Julia. Yeah, they do. And it's their on new... The it's their new... Yeah, on the rocks. It's their <laughs> new team clothing supplier, at least not technical clothing, but their street clothing, Bellstaff. And somebody it's, sent me these pictures, Richard. That's their um, English summer kit, isn't it? Summer kit. <laughs> Looks like their winter kit to me. Um, Scarves and sweaters, and I don't know. It's good looking stuff. You that's you what made you a wear in the English summer. Uh -huh. right? That's what they you got to wear in the English summer. In the English summer, you wrap up warm. Yeah. You said that looks like a, a well dressed bunch of Brits. Yeah. In the pre-show, in the when we did our tech check. Okay, well, congrats to Ben. Ineos Team UK. They've done there's a lot of commercial stuff going on with that team, including Jim Rad James Ratcliffe. Jim Ratcliffe uh, earlier this week at the Royal Automotive Automobile Club in London. I've been there for Formula One stuff. They confirmed what had been widely rumored: their sponsorship, actually principal partnership, because they still have Petron, uh, Pet Petronas as a principal sponsor, but the Ineos is apparently bought into this team, Jim Ratcliffe and co. They have cycling teams. I think they have a soccer team. They, of course, own the America's Cup team. And now they have the Mercedes F1 team. And there was, uh, there was some rumors, Richard, going around that Mercedes was going to do one more season and then drop out. But now this is a five-year deal or so one hears. You hearing any more about this? No. I mean, the only thing with... Um... So Jim is that uh, after 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 he oh, sorry it's just before he um, the announcement came out about the sponsorship with Ben Ainsley. I mean there were there was a discussion going on with um, you know the profit that Enios had um, made uh, that year, which was seven point one billion pounds. And um, Ratcliffe's comment was he said he thought that um, even Enios would have difficulty spending that. Well, I, I, you know, they've got so, shareholders and they've got. Uh, no, I think it's a private company. Are you sure? 
Well, they still they got partners. I, I mean, so. Mr. Ratcliffe's got to put some money, and he's, he lives in Switzerland now. Yeah, well, so I mean, it's tax reasons. It is is the fact that Ineos is a big oil and gas and a fracking company is that going to cause problems in New Zealand? The way the Greenies ha- we had problems uh, with the uh, who was it the French America's Cup team? Uh, what was, well, they, they Arriba, was it Arriba? Were, what was the name of that yeah. team and, and oh, Greenpeace they were, they were and so try, on? Try, trying to claim that the um, care was had uranium in it or something like that, and you know. No, I, I mean, don't. I, I don't think that was it. They were just complaining that this was a, a, oh, sorry, a nuclear, sorry, yeah, a, nuclear yeah, a company that made nuclear yeah, uh, power, power plants or helped and, yeah, and yeah. when they were down there in New Zealand in what 2000 mm. so that's not going to be a problem well you just never know I mean, those guys are lying to themselves okay I'm going to skip through this slide and go to this one Richard this fake news about uh, everybody thought was the AC75 New York Yacht Club we debunked that on this show and in a Facebook post or two that I did. This is their test boat. This is the mule. Interesting, we now have the mule. We have the hawk. I wonder whatever. Mm. And then this video, which we ran, showing again what happened. And it, it's the Yacht Club released this video after that other picture got released, and people said, oh, that's the New York Yacht Club's AC-75, mm. which, of course, it's not. It's the training boat. And this was in Rhode Island last summer, almost a year ago. Mm soon after this boat was launched. But you've got a little bit different take on this than some people. Well, whenever something like this comes out, you sort of think, well, why has it come out so late? Um, you know, what's what's the, the motive in doing that? Um, they'd already released a photo of the boat capsizing pretty much at the, you know, a capsized boat in the, in the water um, pretty much at the time that it happened. Um, I just sort of, and then you've got the fact that this was shot with a drone. Well, I mean, do they always have a drone? You know, in in the year when when they're sailing the practice boat, um, you know, no team is in certainly don't, and I don't know what the other teams do. Obviously, the um, drones right at the right angle just happens to be passing at the right f- frame. Everything else to get the boat in. And then they put up the tail end thing, show, which shows it going in, but it also shows the um, rudder post moving back and forth, which is driving the wing, rudder wing, which is causing the whole thing to go in anyway. So you think so, they did it on purpose? I don't know. I mean, uh, it was the same with well, the let TV. Let me ask, because you cap- and I talked, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the other day we were talking and you said, hey, this is pretty weird. They got a drone. I think they fly a drone. They got, they got a really cool videographer who was... I, I know I, I won't name him in case it wasn't him on this particular shot, but they, they fly drones all the time. They've got the camera mm. in the back end of the boat, probably other cameras. The timing is a little interesting, but you're suggesting that they did this on purpose. They actually well, capsized well, on if, purpose. If you, if you think about it, I mean, one of the things the teams have got to get is they've got to get some hard data on capsizing. What, what happens in the lead up to that so that they can then check that against what their simulator thinks. So when they are training people, they know they can push them right to the edge um, and they're, they're actually measuring that against real data. So if the, boat says, the simulator says, if you get into this situation, you've basically got beyond the point of no return and you're going to capsize and that's what it does to them. If they don't have real data to back that up, they can only surmise that, you know, this has happened, this has happened, therefore you're going to capsize. Okay, then that begs the question, that very soft capsize of ETNZ, which they didn't originally release it, but there were lots of photographers out there who did, and then somebody had a video, which they sent to me. I oh, ran no, they, they was, that, that was that a purposeful, was that on purpose to capsize well, I actually, ETNZ? I, I actually asked them that, and they came back and said, no, it wasn't. But when you look Do, do you believe them? Well, you, you just come back to it, and I mean, and, and you know, the immediate reaction after it was, um, I mean, that that video got on 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 air very quickly, and um, you know, the, the comment that afternoon was, well, you know, we're very pleased now um, because they've done it, but they've also know they have the data. 
and getting that data from something like that is just huge because what that's saying is that you can set your simulator up, you know where that red line is sitting in the simulator, and if you cross it, you, the, these are going to be the consequences. Yeah, okay, and, so New York's of capsize it. of this boat was on purpose, but you don't think he, ETN's that well, you, well, you, well, you've got to you've got to put the possibility in there that it was on purpose. Um, you know, I don't know whether ETNZ's was, but I mean, certainly out of it, um, they got some incredibly useful data that no other team will get until they go through the same thing. And, you know, why wouldn't you just put it on a checklist and see what happens? It's way better to find out, you know, a, a year before the event, what happens when your boat capsizes, how you get it up and how you keep on racing than, than it is waiting until you, yep. you know, what happened with Team New Zealand okay. in the last America's Cup when they had to, boat had to go in and then they find out the awful truth. Okay, let's look at this video that New York Yacht Club's American Magic released here the other day. I think maybe yesterday. And it is an interesting compare and contrast with their friends who've been, they've done several campaigns together, mm. T. Hutch, Terry Hutchinson, yeah. and Dean Barker. Have a look. Well, they sell them 10 years on together. Exactly. By the America's Cup. Wow. It's the oldest trophy in sports history. When you walk into a room, when we've all retired from what we love to do, there are going to be people in the room that have won the cup, and there's going to be the people in the room that have not. The thing that you have to do is be on the side that uh, have won. The boat goes silent, it accelerates, and you, know, you sort of feel like you're pioneering in another part of the, the sailing world. We've been competitors more than we've been teammates. Be interesting to see what he thinks the scorecard is, but I think we're probably even. <laughs> and he's going to say, "I bet you I'm up a couple on him," so he's probably closer to being right. So we raced against each other a lot, and uh, you know, it, it's always a healthy respect. You know, there's always you know, a lot of competition there. I think very quickly we understood each other's strengths and weaknesses and how best to adapt. We have a vision to engage the grassroots of U.S. sailing and set the United States on a path of leadership in the world in our sport. And you know, I can't think of a better reason. Okay. Uh, what would you think of that, Richard? Oh, it's a nice idea. You called nice. it fluffy when, you, when we talked well, the other day. It's not really that hard. I mean, it's, you know, two, two rivals talking nicely about each other and, you know, good on them. Um, What's going to be the reaction in New Zealand to Dean Barker steering New York Yacht Club's boat? I don't think there'll be um, any issue in it at all, really. Um, I mean, the, the you know the country's sort of locked behind Team New Zealand and all that um, you know black hat stuff that was you know there when you know Coots and Butterworth uh, flew the coop. Um, that's all all gone and. Um, I, I, yeah, I just don't think. I mean, he'll have, he'll have a fan following here and, you know, good on him. Um, I don't think there's going to be anything negative about it. Do you think he can win it? Do you think Dean Barker as the helm can win it against your guys? Uh, I don't think the helmsman's got that much to do with it. I think the design, it's all it's all design and, um, you know, how, how they're driving it and, and that sort of thing. I mean, sure, you tell the helmsman makes a difference, you know, at the end of the day and decisions that have to be made in the pre-start and all that sort of thing. But uh, if this is a race, it's going to be one on the design boards and on the simulators and, you know, how close you can get to that red line without um, flipping the boat in. Okay. Richard, anything else on the cup? Julie, any other comments before we wrap this up? Um, um, I, I would just say, I, I again, I commend the all the notes to you because there are lots of different um, opinions and suggestions and ways to look at it. And it's just too much to go over now, but uh, you know, they're all, um, they're all interesting and some of them are important. Okay. Richard. Well, I think the um, next thing of real interest is going to be the sale GP come up with, um, uh, I think it's next weekend with uh, Sabine Ainsley and an America's cup crew. And they're fronting up against uh, people that were largely a, um, 
Oracle Team USA crew. Mm. And um, that's going to put a real edge into that boat, into that event. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are going to be watching that with, with real interest to see how, you know, Ben and Team Ineos get on in there. Well, and, and a, a lot of those teams have, as well. A lot of those teams have been shuffled too. Uh, well, yeah, but the key guys in there with, you know, the key helmsmen are still there. And, um, you know, they're all, you know, very, very well qualified. Yeah, but the, as you know, the, the well, we don't, the flight controllers and so on. It'll be interesting to see if, if uh, Kimo Worthington, who's come on board as the team manager for Rome Kirby's USA team, for example, if that helps. Kimo's a, a, a great campaign manager. He's been around for a long time, just retired from North Sales. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, but, it's interesting, you know, Russell put out that release. I didn't put anything in the show about Sail GP. We're going to focus on that next Tuesday in advance of their first series, which I think is the weekend after next, isn't it? Next weekend is the I, I 20, it was, yeah, it's the, it's 22nd, the, yeah. 23rd. Uh, yeah. But it's coming up here quickly is the in Sydney, the first, first regatta. Mm -hmm. And we'll do a focus on that on Tuesday. But it's interesting that Russell put out that release that having teamed up with IMG, which is now called Endeavor, mm. it's the Mark McCormick's well, old company. And, and IMG is one of their companies. Well, yeah, IMG is the principal company. Endeavor is the overall. But oh. they're a talent agency. They're a, they're a television and a Hollywood, uh, you know, the production company as well. And uh, what I hear is that they have put a stake. They've taken a stake in Sale GP. Mm. an equity stake in re and they've been given an equity stake by Larry and Russell in return for them doing television production yeah. and distro distribution of sale GP this year, which is why mm. I think whisper films in London is probably gone. I haven't heard that for sure. No, it's still in there. Are you sure whisper is? Yep. Because well, I, provisionally, because I mean, I think the um, production's all still being run out of UK, from what I understood. Okay, well, we know that that Shirley, well, this, Shirley Robertson's gone place. and Jody's gone, yeah. so we'll yeah. see. But apparently, they have been given an equity stake in return for doing some production and distribution. And if it's now valued at two hundred, if Sale GP is now valued at two hundred million dollars, based on this, they probably you know gave them a five percent equity stake at tell me what. Oh. 10 million bucks I, or something. I think I think the the real issue in there is what they could the value they can add and um endeavor you, you mean endeavor yeah and when you you know you go in and you re, re, research them and look at you know where they've come from and and what they've done and how they've grown and their reputation uh, which is one for you know getting onto projects very early getting onto projects that not everyone sees the immediate value in and and, and exploiting those um, makes a lot of sense. And of course, from the sailor's point of view, I mean, you've got someone in there like IMG that, you know, did fantastic things and were, were the dominant force in that whole area of professional sport and developing it and individuals turning themselves into brands and, and really making the mega bucks out of the sport that you, you, you see in golf. Well, we hope, let's hope it happens in tennis that IMG was big in golf and tennis and even, sure. even promoted the Pope and Pope tour mm. when, when Pope, the Pope would come to bed. They did one in Valencia when we were still living there and it was massive. Uh, Richard, but, but I, you get that sort of thing coming into sailing, yep. which is again a, a first time that you've had a company of that type and ilk and experience um, in there that can work with sailors. They can also work with sponsors, and they can also work with the events. So, I well, mean, it, let's hope. I, I mean, I agree with you. And I, 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 I've, I had, I, I hired IMG back in '92 to help us in San Diego, and they've been around and involved in the sport on and off for a long time. I am one of the people who is a big and I'm not, I'm not particularly close anymore to Larry or Russell, but I think, I hope this thing works. I'm a big fan of Larry's for putting in north of three quarters of a billion dollars into mm. the sport sure. and has, and it's the only, uh, you got the TP 52s, which are starting up in a month or so. And that's probably the highest end professional part of the sport, but sale GP as a professional league and, you know, really professional and Larry backing that. I hope it works. Unlike some of the other, you know, some of our colleagues who are, it's, you know, sale GP haters almost or Larry haters. And I, I hope this thing works because it, it will help the sport. It'll do a lot for the sport. And as I said the other day down in San Diego, when I was on that panel down at say U S sailings, sailing leadership 
platform. The biggest thing that would happen, Richard, the best thing that could happen to the sport in this country is if New York wins it back. That would cause a lot of media and a lot of promotion. But I think the second biggest thing that could happen is if Sale GP really does work out mm. and becomes a regular feature because, you know, you get – obviously Sydney's a big, big deal. And San Francisco and New York are big media deals and big markets. And then you've got cows and you've got now mm. Denmark. And it looks like the last event – I hear the last event's going to be in Spain, not in France, by mm. the way, because they've got that mm. new Spanish team. So I hope it works. I know you don't have a Kiwi team, so I know, therefore, you're not so interested in it, and the Kiwi market's not very interested in it. Well, but this is where I think the America's Cup connection is going to work with Ainsley. And, I mean, if that gets talked up and people see there's a really hard edge in that, uh, then that will pull the interest from the countries that are you know, not directly involved in sale GP. It's all, I mean, it's it's all about it's names, and I think you're right. I think Ben Ainsley is going to have a huge impact positive impact on sale gp don't, don't you agree julia yeah there's a whole string now about who's better um that, uh, ainsley or or uh, uh outer edge or uh, slingsby tommy slingsby, slingsby. yeah yeah mm. uh, i mean they're, they're all really good helmsman and they've got really good teams in there and the other thing is you know when you go back and look at that you know, final in marseille i mean you know um nathan outeridge came very very close to winning that and that was with a, an all Japan team. So, and Asian teams finished second and third in that regatta. So it's you know it's got potential to really do things. And um, I think the first year, you know, particularly with Sydney, the way that started off, I mean, that was just really a, you know blowing out the pipes and getting the whole thing rolling. And it it had to progress on from there. I don't think it really sort of lifted that much off the. Uh, the, the the plateau for you know a whole bunch of reasons but i think it was still that everyone was still coming to grips with this event working out you know if it was going to work and how it worked yep. and how you could improve it yep and then this year we should see some of that come in and then with the you know input of endeavor you're going to see another layer go on on that and it could take it into a you know whole new direction richard final question what what about these boats are the Sail GP boats going to go faster this year than the America's Cup 75s, the AC 75s? How fast are the AC 75s well, going right now? Well, I, I mean, I, I would be surprised if they haven't gone above 50 already. Um, you know, way back, I sort of asked, you know, Team New Zealand guys who what was going to be quicker, and they just came back and said, well, we've got more writing moments. And, you know, if you've got a, a longer boat with more more riding moment, I mean, it, it has to be quicker at, at some well, stage. I'm not sure boat length has much to do with it at this stage, but no, certainly but riding got, moment and the lightness of the boat. The yeah. lightness of the boat and riding moment's yeah. a big deal. Yeah. Richard so, Gladwell, fun. thank you very much. Thank Anything, you. Yeah. Julia, we can press on here? We're two hours, exactly two hours in. Yeah, it's, it's time to go, but as I say, there's lots of, interesting stuff going on so don't ignore the notes richard we yeah as do <laughs> always goes back and you should too richard go back and look through the comments and yeah. and i always do and like the ones that i like and and that we find richard gladwell down in auckland thank you sir thank you thank very you. much for joining us really appreciate happy, it happy, happy valentine's day tom thank you i need I, and, and to you that's having those <laughs> nice oh, I have one yesterday. having those nice flowers <laughs> oh, over there by julia has has lived Bite them off for the flowers coming in the door the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you can't blame them, Richard. No, no, that's right. It just shows okay. your yeah. average Kiwi sailing fan. <laughs> Thanks again. Right. Take good care. Take care. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. 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 Okay. Uh, just wrap this up. I again want to thank Clark Chapin, who gave us some statistics because we are now starting to have sponsors approach us and we're going to have uh, a sponsor for each show. If you're interested, please contact me either my personal info or at sailing illustrated uh, at gmail.com. But uh, we are really pleased. Richard's show back in January of 2019, these stats again provided by Clark Chapin. Thanks Clark has been our biggest show all, over 15,000 views. Likewise, Chris Welsh, who's a recent, that's W E L S H by the way. Yeah. We'll get that corrected. It's a big show, but the, the trend is terrific. And even recently, even this month, as Clark points out, the median views for the last 20 shows continue to climb. So we're getting a lot of eyeballs. We think there's a fair bit of value for a tops and tails uh, uh, brought to you by type 
sponsorship. So we're going to go to that. Plus, all of you who contribute, whether by uh, Patreon or now via PayPal, it's super, super appreciated because it keeps us afloat, keeps our lights operating. We need to buy some new equipment. We're going to start to go on the road a little bit more like we did down to San Diego. So you can also contribute directly via PayPal if you are so inclined. PayPal.me slash Sailing Illustrated. So with that, Julia, anything else? Any other comments we need to take care of before we go away? No, just to repeat, I hope everybody has a good Valentine's Day. If you're in in this hemisphere, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, even if it even if it's uh, after the fact, even Absolutely. you know, Richard could go out and have a nice Valentine's Day. He's I, still I, down there watching. I think listening. he should. I think he should. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he can still go out. We're going to go out, aren't we? To go to the. SDY or to the St. Francis Yacht Club and have a Valentine's Day dinner tonight. We are. Richard, we wish you were with us. Yes. I, I could get on a plane and get there, but I think I'd be a bit late. I think you'd be late. Okay. Yeah. Thanks yeah. again. Uh, yeah. We want to th- say thanks to everybody who gave us the credits for today's show for audio as well as video and images. And hope you have a very nice Valentine's Day if you are celebrating that. And you too, Julia. Thanks again for all you do for us. Hope you have a great weekend wherever in the world you are, and we hope to see you next Tuesday, same time, same channel. In the meantime, sail fast, sail safe, and have fun. Ciao. Bye.